So what did he do with his stimo sievers? He implanted a stimo siever in a macaque who had been known to terrorize the other macaques in their cage. Oh, all right. He put a lever in the cage that when it was pulled, it would activate the stim siever in this bully and it would pacify him. Is this for the other monkeys to pull? A female in the cage <laughs> <laughs> went, hey, <laughs> look what happens when I do this. <laughs> And she, quote, yanked it often and with gusto. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Imagine having a calm down lever for the cranky person at your workplace. Yeah. The old dream of an individual overpowering the strength of a dictator by remote control has been fulfilled, at least in our monkey colonies. Or just having a new dictator who can control our behaviour with a lever. Yeah. I, I don't think we ended up in democracy of the monkeys at that point. Nineteen thirty five. John Fulton is a head of physiology at Yale and he gave a lecture in London. He and his colleague, a chappy called Carlisle Jacobson, they're curious about the role of specific areas of the brain and what facilitating tasks that required memory. What areas, you know, yeah. facilitate Where do you stuff. store your memories? Yeah, and, and to suss it out, they'd been experimenting on a couple of chimps. Uh huh. Lucy and Becky. Mm-hmm. One of the projects. So the task involved training Lucy and Becky to use sticks to get food that was out of their reach. Okay. Uh-huh. So Lucy was pretty calm. She, when she failed, she's like, oh, don't worry about it. Keep plugging away until it works. No yeah, worries. She's resilient. She is. She's resilient. Pick herself up off the ground. Yep. But Becky? Becky was different. So one account by an author called Paul Offit, he says, she would fly into a rage, pull her hair, defecate, and throw her feces at the scientists. <laughs> you know is the universal response of- We've all done it. I don't like how things have gone. I've done it. Scientists have made me want to actually put my hand and throw it at them. No, this is definitely, uh, I've been in meetings where that has been, uh, multiple people have yeah, done it, that. Yeah, it's a science communication technique. Yes. The real experiment, however, came afterwards when they removed the prefrontal lobes of the chimps. <sighs> My God. So after this intervention, Lucy forgot how to get the food. Like she couldn't. <laughs> okay. Do it. I, yeah, forgot puts a little bit more agency in Lucy. I would say potentially the remembering how to get the food was taken from her. Stopped being able to, perhaps. D- d- yeah. Taken from yeah. her by knife. Could no like, longer. Like yeah. if you have half of your brain cut out, yeah. saying that I know. What's long- wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> you forgot my name. You idiot. Becky still was shit at it too, but you know, even worse. But they said, more interestingly, she didn't seem to give a shit. No more raging, no more poop throwing. Just oh, like, she calmed down. She's like, yeah. That was, that was her poop Whatever. throwing. In the, in yeah, the it was front. in that bit of the brain. That's where they store poop throwing. Yeah. And that's the wholesome show. Think about it next time you're flinging shit. Poke yourself really hard in the frontal lobe. See if you lose the urge. So Fulton, the main man, said, destroying the prefrontal lobes of the violent, quote, neurotic Becky made her calm and compliant. Okay, I don't like where that's going. Jacobson, the co-conspirator, said uh, looked, it was like she had uh, joined a happiness cult. <laughs> For chimpanzees. Yep. So the work directly influenced someone we've talked about before. They were sitting in the audience of this 1935 lecture, Portuguese psychiatrist called Edgar Moniz. Or Moniz. Mm-hmm. So he, for those who don't remember, Nobel Prize winning pioneer in performing lobotomies on psychotic patients. Ah. So we'll put the uh, link to that episode in the show notes. Fulton was uh, initially shocked that his method of pacifying chimps had been applied to humans, but then he became a fan of psychosurgery. And was the thought that his method led directly to lobotomies or were there other things going on at the time? Well, look, there's probably many precipitants, but it turned, Moniz or Moniz was clearly went, oh, hang on, I've got an idea. <laughs> but Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado, who was one of Fulton's star mentees at Yale, Mm-hmm. never shared the enthusiasm for this cutting brains to fix people. I'm on his side. Yeah. He thought, or his quote was, I thought Fulton and Moniz's idea of destroying the brain was absolutely horrendous. He preferred a more conservative approach to mental illness treatment. My idea, he says, was to avoid lobotomy with the help of electrodes implanted into the brain. Welcome. To the Wholesome Show, the podcast that will risk experimental brain surgery to try and control itself around the whole of science. I know I have. Who are you? I'm Will Grant. And I'm not Will Grant. I'm Rudolf Griffin G. Lambert. So Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado, he was born in Spain. I know, it's amazing from a name like that that you would imagine. 1915 he was born, which is a while ago. So as a young man, he thought he'd follow in his father's footsteps to get into the essential world of ophthalmology. Mm. 1933, he goes to Madrid Medical School. 
But when he got to the Madrid Medical School, he, quote, fell under the spell of the father of neuroscience, 1906 Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine, Santiago Ramón y Cajal. As in 1933. 1936, Spanish Civil War goes boom and Delgado signs up for the Republicans to fight against Franco. Cool. Frank, Franco the fascist. So he served as an officer in the medical corps. After Franco's troops crushed the Republicans, he was in prison for five months. Oh. And then he got released and he went back to school. Oh, well, there you go. But despite that, he was dogged for, for years later. Throughout his life, he was dogged by rumours that he was a supporter of Franco and fascism. Dogged by rumours in Spain that, ah, you supported the winners. It's a weird thing to- Well, yeah, because well, just keep the, the word fascist and stuff in mind. Okay. Years later at a scientific conference, someone threw a pie in his face for being a Franco fascist oh, fan, okay. which he is not. Anyway, he graduates, MD and a doctorate of science. Okay. So go Delgado. 1946, he gets a fellowship at Yale. 1950, he gets a full-time gig at the Department of Physiology under the direction of John Filton, mm-hmm. the former chimpanzee lobotomizer. So at this point, apparently Delgado was known as a bit of a tech wizard. And one source says, look, I th- they actually reckon the key to his scientific success was his talent as an inventor. Okay. He started experiments that would, quote, capitalize on his talents as a builder of ingenious gadgets, implanting electrodes and radio receivers and things that would allow him to deliver electrical stimuli to brains. It is, it is a, a bit of a mind melt. You know, when suddenly someone with electronics gets interested in the brain. What about brains? <laughs> okay, okay. Like automatic okay. light switch or mind control. So his early experiments were on, as you'd expect, an array of creatures. And he'd run wires from implanted electrodes that'd come out through the skull and the skin and they'd be connected to these bulk electronic contraptions that would record data and could deliver electrical yeah, okay, pulses. Okay. But that meant restricted movement in the participants, participant subjects, and also they're more prone to infections because they had wires permanently um, okay. in the brain. What sort of people are they experimenting These are animals. Point? Animals, okay. He designed these radio-equipped, what he called, stimo-sievers. <laughs> stimo-sievers. Stimo-sievers. <laughs> stimo-sievers. <laughs> they're about the size of a US quarter, so what's that, 10 cent piece in Australian currency? They can be fully implanted in the brain. You look at me like you're despairing. Don't be sad. This is a great story. Why wouldn't I despair? (laughs) Why wouldn't I despair? This is So they could be fully implanted and then they'd be powered by a battery pack you could strap to the head or wear around the neck. Cool. So you don't have to keep them plugged into the wall. No. Um, Also, just as a side, he invented the implantable chemotrodes that could release precise amounts of drugs directly into the brain. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. We're not going to get into those because there's a a lot to his story. So what do you do with his stimo sievers? One demo. He implanted a stimo receiver in a macaque who had been known to terrorize the other macaques in their cage. Oh, all right. Fuck with monkey. He put a lever in the cage that when it was pushed or pulled, it would activate the stim receiver in this bully and it would pacify him. Is this for the other monkeys to pull? A female in the cage <laughs> <laughs> went, hey, <laughs> look what happens when I do this. <laughs> And she, quote, yanked it often and with gusto. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Imagine having a calm down lever for the cranky person at your workplace. Yeah. Delgado's, quote, the old dream of an individual overpowering the strength of a dictator by remote control has been fulfilled, at least in our monkey colonies. You know, that old dream. Or just having a new dictator who can control our behaviour with a lever. Yeah. It's as if one dictator gets replaced. I don't think we ended up in democracy of the monkeys at that point. Another demo. Delgado programmed a chimpanzee called Patty using a stim receiver. Uh, it would detect distinctive signals emitted by her amygdala or amygdala, depending mm-hmm. on where you're listening. And so the amygdala, depending on who you ask, regulates anxiety, aggression, fear conditioning, okay. controls emotional memory or is involved in it and social cognition. And in some cases, you stimulate the amygdala, you get evocations of fear and anxiety in humans, at least this is more recently. And certainly if you get lesions near it, it can block certain fear responses and things. So it's got stuff to do with a it's lot of, something in there it in does your things, emotions in your emotion in your i think it's your limbic system okay so whenever this uh stim receiver detected a spike or a spindle within the amygdala it stimulated another part of patty's brain to produce quote an aversive reaction <laughs> aka painful or unpleasant sensation so after two hours of this negative feedback oh my god patty's amygdala produced 50 percent fewer spikes or spindles okay it's, it's a calm down sort of yeah after six Feedback days, it had dropped by 99%. Oh. So she became uh, quieter, less attentive, and less motivated during behavioural testing. Okay, we've just turned her off. Yeah, we're just like, uh, Yeah. 
So Delgado hypothesized that this, uh, what he called automatic learning, which is, I suppose, not untrue, but mm. the technique could be used on others or other monkeys or maybe people to stop panic attacks, seizures, and uh, other brain disorders. Okay, but, but you know, some sort of stimulation of the amygdala might then control emotion. So that's, that's doing something there. Yeah, or at least, yeah, remove negative ones or something. Um, he did many other experiments which he reckoned showed that functions traditionally related to the psyche, like friendliness, pleasure, verbal expression, etc., that these could be induced, modified, and inhibited by direct electrical stimulation of the brain. Mm -hmm. And he spoke generally around these times about how he was able to play monkeys and cats like little electronic toys <laughs> that would yawn, hide, fight, play, mate, and go to sleep on command. So that's fine. <laughs> He's successful. So, of course, he put stim sievers into people, stim o -sievers. He began to experiment with humans early 1950s. Uh, most of his subjects were schizophrenics and epileptics at a, quote, now defunct state hospital for mental diseases in Rhode Island. Um, and he said, look, it's fine because he only experimented on patients science could no longer do anything for. Well, yeah, so of it's course. Cool. Yeah. Can't do anything else, so let's plant things in their brains. Yeah, yeah. Other than look after them? No, nah, it's a logical next step. Mm. Okay. 1952, he, it, it suggested he became the first researcher to report on the effects of implantation of electrodes into human brains and the longer-term effects thereof. It was claimed his devices would spark intense euphoria, anger, laughter, friendliness, and even a little bit of lust in some of his human subjects. So he wrote about results like this one, where a, a female subject whose stimulation generated extreme terror afterwards. Oh, God. But then she said, it, when it wore off, she remembered her fear but wasn't really upset by the memory. Oh, okay. So I was like, ah, oh, my fucking God, everything's – I've never been so frightened in my life. It's off. Oh, yeah, I remember being scared, but that's what ifs. Oh, still. Still. Raw, unbounded, not connected to anything fear. It sounds like I don't uh, want to do this experiment anymore. No. I'll take my epilepsy and schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, another one, a sullen 11-year-old epileptic boy became chatty and friendly <laughs> when he was zapped. <laughs> Hey, he exclaims, you can keep me here longer when you give me these. Oh, that's nice. And he also announced, I'd like to be a girl. Oh, okay. Well, that was, I mean, was there that go. there before? No. Oh. It's not clear no. if he continued, but that's, that was part of the gig. Well. And of course, it wouldn't be a brain fiddling experiment on a show like this without mentioning some wrong. It wasn't too wrong. 36-year-old female epileptic, normally very quiet and proper. Mm. She'd get stimulated. She would giggle, make funny comments and hit on the researchers. She made funny comments. Like what's brown and sticky? A stick. <laughs> Let's bang. Well, she just hit on them. Well, you hit on your way, I hit on mine. Don't you do that? You walk into bar and go, what's brown and sticky? A stick. Let's bang. It's not a good enough joke in my books. How in the hell did you manage to get a wife? Oh, it's the delivery, man. It's the delivery. Over the next couple of decades, he implanted electrodes into probably 25 odd subjects. The therapeutic benefits were mixed. No. And it seems he would turn away more patients than he would treat. So he wasn't just like indiscriminately banging, okay, okay. banging the trodes in. So are people coming to him and saying, I want the electrodes? Well, yeah, it's, it's, there's one story. All that, the sullen 11-year-olds are like, saying, I want to. I want to be able to say I want to be a girl. This is one example. A young woman, her parents had her committed to a mental hospital because she was so violent and promiscuous. Mm. Mm. Which 1950s, well, look, fuck knows what that means. Let's let's just go with the so violent. Uh, could be. That, that could be a problem in the 1950s or now. The Promiscuity <laughs> is a – It's a. let's say there are ambiguities around that word. Yeah. And I get that parents can be assholes about that. Can they? But also that most societies would recognise there's an upper limit to promiscuity that we accept. Yeah. yeah. It's different from – Like if she's walking down the street <clears throat> with three dudes in her, you'd be like, I think you're being a bit promiscuous. I think I think something. I, 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 I'm not to – Screaming eagle. I'm not here putting in boundaries the on anyone. But, uh, yeah, like we, we certainly yeah. accept more than the 1950s. But, but not that. But not that. I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> So the parents and the daughter apparently pleaded with him to implant um, electrodes, okay. but he refused saying electrical stimulation was too unreliable. Ah, oh, it won't work for you, darling. No. But he reckons he got best results when it was treating people with chronic pain. Oh, okay. Well, so, okay. yeah, as you'd expect, this dude who basically been smashed up in a car accident, chronic pain, didn't respond to drug treatments. So he got a stimo siever. It relieved both his pain and the depression hey. that it had been causing. Oh, that sounds good. So he could go back to work and act kind of normal. So this is all great but this isn't the stuff that catapulted him into public attention. What? What did? Just to remind. Delgado, fascinated by aggressive and violent behavior. Yep. Wanted to really test the stimo siever. Like, let's see how good it is. Wanted to use it on an animal. 
And let's not forget, and this is critical, he's Spanish. Oh. Delgado says, I thought, which is the animal which is characterized by his aggressive behavior? The fighting bull. We're going to turn up the fighting bull? Get a more aggressive fighting bull? Yeah. You reckon you're angry now? Oh, my God. <laughs> Listen to this. <laughs> you fucking nut jobs. Hold my cerveza. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, what a barbaric sport. Tell me more. So, Spanish University supplied funds and a bull breeder in bull. Cordoba, four bulls in a bull ring. 1963. So, he and his wife and some assistants, a few days and uh, over about three days, they tranquilized a bunch of bulls, fitted them with stereotactic frames over their skulls. What is that? Frames. Stuff. What's the stereotactic? Oh, it's you could touch things in two dimensions. Okay. And so he put the stimo sievers in their brains. Now, before the demo, the most famous demo began, allegedly a bunch of bullfighters got this big bull called Lucero or Lucero, got him really psyched up, <laughs> flicking their capes at him and getting him really- Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. They've got the hats. They're, they're doing all the dance in front of the bull. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Got him, got him, got I, him jazzed. I, I am on the bull's side here. Yeah. Many descriptions of what happened. Jack L. Hay, I'll give you that one. He's a guy writing in Discovery Magazine. This is how he describes what happened. The investigator- dressed incongruously in a sweater and tie and holding a small metal box, stands in a bull ring. Well, I get it. Sweater and tie in a, in a bull ring. You know what it, no, 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 no. No, this is ridiculous. The, the, the one time in your life as a wear non- the outfit, right? As a non-matador. Wear yes. the outfit. The like, hat with the things. Put, like put, put a white lab coat over the top, mm. like just to go matador and scientist. But, you know, go. Science out of the Commit door. to the bit. I agree. Commit to the bit. But he did not. So he taunts the bull with a gesture. I think he actually may have had a cape or something. So he's, you know, flicky flick, which makes bulls rather <laughs> peeved. Suddenly the bull turns I'm and imagining charges. I'm matador music out the back. The bull goes, dunk, 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 and comes running mm-hmm. after him. Mm-hmm. He takes a couple of steps back, presses the button, which sends obviously a signal to the stimo siever. Did he, did, did he press the dial up or dial down button? Just the button, the, the stimulant, the, the ping button. The bull halts in mid-stride and then goes out and turns away. Whoa. Bull goes, I'm going to, I don't care. Turn off the bull. Yeah, turned off the bull. So word spread of what he was doing. This isn't the only time he did it, but this is one of the big ones. And Spanish television crew turns up, hundreds of people gather to watch him do these tests with different bulls, you know, piss them off, run at him, push the button, turn yeah. them off. But the most significant media coverage came a couple of years later. So he was he was showing slides and doing a lecture in New York. And afterwards, a New York Times reporter comes up and says, can I have, can I, can I have pictures? I said, sure. Next day, front page New York Times. Wow. The quote was, the most spectacular demonstration ever performed of the deliberate modification of animal behavior through external control of the brain. Delgado says, look, the stimo siever conquered the bull's aggressive behavior. Other experts felt differently. So like one neurophysiologist, University of Michigan, guy called Valenstein, he said, no, the zapper just stopped muscle control. So just physically made it not. Oh, work so properly. it's still angry, but it couldn't do it yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. I'm pissed, but you've Oh, that's wildly different. Isn't it? Like wildly Isn't different. It? Yeah. Uh yeah. <laughs> it's furious inside its brain, but its legs no oh, longer I can't work. Versus, son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> not like, hey, I'm mad at ah, oh, whatever. Look, flower. When he was asked in an interview years later about these objections, apparently Delgado shrugs. His experiment, he says. Naturally, it could be interpreted in one way or another. Sure, sure. But stands by his claims. 2005, so years later, a team of physicians reported in Brain Research Reviews that it was just a big publicity stunt. 2017 paper then said, look, little is available of the literature beyond the New York Times article. Details of what actually happened, where he placed the actual electrodes, how the electronics worked, was it done once or over many, many times. No actual formal publication about it. So there's a lot of speculation. Some sources say the implant went into his the bull's caudate nucleus. It may play a role in goal-directed behavior. Yeah, that's a bull. Yeah. Choosing actions that are likely to lead to a positive outcome. Yeah, that's that's killing the matador. Could exactly <laughs> may contribute to other cognitive functions as well as memory may, and movement. May, may contribute to other cognitive functions. Yeah, yeah other brain <laughs> misc. Yeah, other visual information, memory and movement come up quite a bit. Oh, you don't you don't see the red cape anymore. Yeah, and, and if you do, you can't move or you've forgotten. Anyway, 1969, Delgado's invited to contribute to, uh, uh, to a volume or a series of volumes that come out apparently regularly. There's, there's at least 40 or 50 of them. It's called World Perspectives. So there's an editorial board, 12 of the world's most distinguished leaders in ethics, sociology, economics, spirituality, and science. Three of them 
Nobel laureates, or is it Laurier? How many matadors, though? None. I know, I know. I was going to point that out. Hmm. It's a lack. There's a hole in the expertise. So the series editor was a renowned philosopher. Um, his life was devoted to inviting <laughs> leading scientists and thinkers to speculate on the societal and philosophical implications of their narrow fields, basically to extrapolate an idea in relation to life. Yeah, stay, take it's it big. out further. It's big. So if you've uh, down-stimulated a bull, what does it mean for Everything. world peace? Not far off. So you get a volume in this series. Write a volume. Yeah. So Delgado calls his volume physical control of the mind towards a psycho-civilized society. Oh, okay. Cool. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, buddy. A psycho-civilized society. Why have a red cape when you can have a red flag? <laughs> All right, what's he reckon? So leading psychologist at the time called the book, quote, an invaluable and authoritative analysis of the nature of human nature. Mm -hmm. Scientific American Review, thoughtful, up-to-date account of electrical stimulation experiments, but added that the research was somewhat ominous. <laughs> Others would just freak the fuck out like they were just, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Because there was pictures of monkeys, cats, and two young women with uh, stimo sievers okay. fixed to their skulls. Just slow down there. Monkeys, cats, and two young women. Not you, all in the same room. You said it a little bit quickly. Yeah. Like they are- Is this one of those timing things again? Categor categorically sort of different. I, I don't see categories. Uh, yeah. But there were pictures of lots of creatures, including oh, look, two young women. These pictures never go well amongst people who aren't into that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It didn't help also that Del Delgado asserts- Humanity was on the verge of conquering the mind, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. should shift its mission from the ancient <clears throat> dictum, know thyself, to construct thyself. Yeah, okay. Which is fine. All right, yeah. His assertion kind of got people going, oh dear. People said, look, his discussion of his scientific findings were basically modest and objective, which is cool. Mm. It didn't go crazy. But philosophical speculations were grandiose and went beyond the data. Yeah, sure. Which but is not he was, excellent. He was asked to. Like they said, they he said, was. buddy, he make was. a volume speculated on where, where it can Speculate beyond the data. That's the, the, the subtitle of the literally series. Literally the thing they said, yeah. hey, speculate beyond your data. And That's I think people should like do it. It's good fun. I agree. But that, of course, because he had a weight and, you know, the volume it, it, was within, was controlled by all these very august folk. It, it also does. You know, if you, you know, you could be a person driven by counting the data or, you know, mm. what's right in front of you. And that makes 99% of your work all, all fine. Yeah. But if you are asked to speculate, then sometimes that does uncork the things inside you that should remain corked. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. th th there are certainly scientists and people out there who- Scientists and people. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both types. But speculate why? Wildly, some people go straight to the wrong place. Oh, I'm, I'm going to stop. <laughs> he made this assertion about constructing ourselves and conquering the mind, but his intent was benevolent and he wanted to encourage the development of a, a future psycho-civilized human being. You know, it's weird who, who, who else's intent has it's been benevolent. benevolent. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Very few truly evil people go, no, I, I, I just want to break I, shit. I'm doing it people. for evil. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm doing it for evil. Yeah. A lot of the people that yeah. get into really bad places are like, no, my my version yeah. is the right version. Mussolini was a cuddly man who, who loved flowers. Mm. Uh, Delgado said, used wisely, neurotechnology could help create a less cruel, happier, and better man. So he meant, he meant well, mm. but it wasn't necessarily taken well. And- Basically, he didn't clearly delineate between his science from his philosophy, which mm. didn't help, mm. and he was right for attack. It didn't help other things that were going on at the time, like a book written in 1970 called Violence and the Brain, written by Frank Irvine or Irvin and Vernon Mark. It explored the potential applications of neurotechnologies. These guys were brain implant researchers at Harvard, and Delgado apparently had collaborated a little bit with them. The authors, among other things, suggested that neurotechnologies might quell the violent tendencies of African-Americans who riot in inner cities. So, you know, it's just a social service. You know, could have left it at quell violent tendencies. Yeah. You, you don't. But they didn't. It's your examples sometimes. It's, it's the examples that give you away. It's As every lawyer apparently learns in good question personship, Know when to stop. Know when to stop. My God. Oh, you know, wow. you know, how did you know the person bit so-and-so's nose off? And it's like, did you see them bite their nose off? No. Stop there. As opposed to, how do you know he bit his nose off? I saw him spit it out. Don't ask the next question. Don't say the next thing. And this was the case here. So they said that. 
1972, brain implant experiments of the psychiatric, oh, sorry, psychiatrist Robert Heath, who was at Tulane University. He said that he had changed the sexual orientation of a male homosexual by stimulating his brain septal region while he had intercourse with a female prostitute. Oh. So I'm going to put this brain what? plant in you, bang what? a lady, I'm going to zap you, and you're going to become straight. Did, did that get ethical approval? Yes, absolutely. I, I just wonder about the funding as well. <laughs> exactly. <for that. laughs> Who funded it? <laughs> okay. No, I, look, I, I, I can appreciate that there, there may have been people in that time who, who had tendencies, uh, sexual orientations that they didn't want. I, I don't know if this person didn't want them. I'm, I don't know the See, circumstances. Surely, surely you have to be con- somewhat consenting to that experiment. Yeah, but you might have been poor and they said, I'll give you a hundred bucks. Oh, I don't think they did that, surely. I, I don't know. Looking, oh, I, looking for poor gay people we can trick into being hetero by putting a wire in their brain while they fuck a woman that they don't want. Who's, who's also being paid. I, I'm just imagining I'm just imagining putting the poster up around uni to Look, try and advertise your that. Your blunt. And you've got the little rip off there. It's like, oh, oh you had me at uh, <laughs> looking, looking for. <laughs> poor and gay and, and happy yeah. with an electrode and. and gay, <laughs> gay, poor, 100 bucks. All you've got to do, very small font. <laughs> Have an electrode put in your brain and bang a female prostitute <laughs> while we watch. Also in 1972, a psychiatrist, Peter Bregan. He was a libertarian psychiatrist. A <laughs> libertarian psychiatrist. And I'd, be, I'd read through this quickly and I thought, sounds like a Scientologist to me. He was a Scientologist. So he was against drugs, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, and biological psychiatry as Scientologists are. Ah, that's yeah, part yeah, of their yeah, yeah. edict. In fact, that's the, the core that's, thing. That's the thing. So he um, gave testimony to... Congress for some reason, and he lumped Delgado and the authors of the book who wanted to interfere with uh, inner city folk, and Heath, the guy who fixed uh, a gay gentleman who was poor, he lumped them all together with proponents of lobotomies and accused them all of seeking, quote, a society in which everyone who deviates from the norm will be surgically mutilated. So all this was going on. He also quoted liberally and very selectively from Delgado's book and others, and basically singled out Delgado as the great apologist for technological totalitarianism. <laughs> oh, and also people have just become aware of the CIA's MK Ultra experiments. Yeah. So all this was going on while Delgado was doing what he was doing. You know, just thinking yeah. about the climate at the time. Yeah, the, it was great. The, there was a whole bunch of people doing all sorts of experimental work that is in this direction. Yeah. So I can understand why people are like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. Not whoa. a great time to be called out on this I stuff. don't want to be a bull that can just be turned off. So then, of course, things got weird. So, for example, just one example. A woman accused um, Delgado of implanting Stimo C was in her brain and sued Yale for a million bucks. He'd never oh. even met her. Oh, so she's just making it just up. like your- you're uh, in my brain as classic, you know, um, deep state, tinfoil hat, etc. In the midst of it all, Spanish Minister of Health said to Delgado, why don't you come back to Madrid and help me organise a new medical school? And he said, fuck yeah. He claims it wasn't because of what was going on and the controversy, but because the offer was too good to refuse. He, was, he said, could I have the facilities I have at Yale? Yeah. And the minister said, no, better. Oh. So he said, sure, I'll go back. So he goes back to Spain, then also, just coincidence, shifts his focus from to non-invasive neurostimulation. So he invents a halo-like device that was described, like a helmet or something that can do electromagnetic pulses to specific regions of the brain, which is pretty cool. Mm. Um, he would test the gadget on animals, human volunteers, him, his daughter. <laughs> I mean, him is fine. Um, he discovered he could induce drowsiness, alertness, and other states in people. So it's basically a <laughs> forerunner for I, stuff. Uh, inducing alertness is not hard. Like I, I, yeah, I clap I, your hands really loud. I know unexpectedly. many, many techniques. Well, you know, and and with slightly more inv- invasive versions, you can uh, induce alertness. And, and it seems to be that he was his stuff was forerunner for transcranial magnetic stimulation. And we did a previous episode on that is. about. Fuck, five years ago. Anyway, that's in the show notes too. He and his colleagues also had some success in treating tremors for Parkinson's. So there were, uh, okay. you know, there were results. This wasn't just wild experimentation for the hell of it. So towards the end of his life, he did an interview with um, John Horgan, Scientific American, um, 2005. So he was 89. He died at 96, so 2011. So he's quite old. He described himself as a libertarian and a pacifist whose goal as a scientist was to liberate us from our biology and especially from mental illness and violent aggression. 
He's a sweet I, old man by I, then. I get the thinking that you're doing, but the whole liberate from our biology. Sweet old man, therefore yeah, yeah, intentions yeah. perfect. Yeah. But he did understand why people were often offended by his stuff. <laughs> he said, look, they're thinking, how is it possible that I am mainly the result of chemicals in the brain? This is distasteful. I don't like it at all. This is him describing folks. But he's saying, look, if the research leads to better treatments for brain disorders, it's wonderful. So, you know, basically shut up. This is awesome. Mm. So across his life, he wrote, it seems, about 500 articles and six books. Wow, okay. His final book was 1989. It was titled Happiness, 14 editions. Um, but he wasn't and hasn't been and isn't cited much, which um, people have – they've speculated why. And Delgado also – he said, look, he doubts a lot of modern brain stimulation researchers would cite him because he's controversial. He doesn't think that's why. He reckons it could just be ignorance because a lot of the modern databases don't include publications from the 50s and 60s. That's his call. Okay. Another, another source says, oh, it's probably because he was mostly publishing in Spanish journals, so no one read them. In the, in the Scientific American interview, he says um, he thought neuroscientists also could be too obsessed with linking specific cognitive mechanisms to specific neural regions. Yeah. Well. So too obsessed with going the foot bones connected to the <clears throat> happy bone. And he said, people are trying to investigate where is the area of the brain essential to consciousness? That's a silly question because consciousness and cognition in general almost certainly stem from the workings of the whole brain. The whole brain is everything. Yeah. Final thoughts from Jose Delgado when he was being interviewed again. Can you avoid knowledge? You cannot. What? Can you avoid technology? You cannot. Okay. Things are going to go ahead in spite of ethics, in spite of your personal beliefs, uh, in uh, spite of everything. Uh in spite of ethics. <laughs> Thanks, dude, who signed up to a fascist regime. No, he like, didn't. He did. No, he was anti. Yeah, but what year did he go back to Madrid? 60s. Yeah. Oh, he ended up dying in America, though. He went back to the US. Right yeah, in the okay. Life, so it's okay. Yeah. No, Franco was still in power in the 60s. It's just the classic call. The classic call is, what are you going to do? Shit's going to happen anyway, no, so don't worry you. about it. Fuck you. Shit's going to happen anyway. We choose the shit that's going to happen. Finish there. Bye-bye. <laughs>